the ambassador Heidi Lee Shaw, the ambassador Portugal ambassador in Singapore, Professor Laura Pang, the visiting professorial fellow ICS Singapore. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it is our honor and privilege to call upon Yamo Bahagia, Dr. Muhammad Yusuf Ahmad, the Director of the Institutes of ASEAN Studies and Global Affairs, to moderate the following presentations. Association. The purpose of that meeting was basically uh, he wanted Portuguese and how basically during that time the Dutch slaughtered the Portuguese. Margaret Sutton in a book said it very well when she interviewed those people and she, she mentioned that it is uh, a time for secret church services but were unable to crush the spirit. Um, it's a bit of a dangerous situation where Portuguese people here and uh, Portuguese Eurasians here and uh, I have to be especially careful because my father-in-law is here. Again, again, I'm wondering, is there any truth to this, um, especially based on Dutch records? And where was the source of this assumption? I think what happened was uh, they were greatly influenced by two main people. They were historians, both of them have passed away. One was a Portuguese priest named Father Pintado, who had also written many books about the Portuguese, their findings in their books, right? So, as I mentioned, the Dutch period in America was actually for 160 years. Well, it was inconceivable that this strong fortress could fall into the hands of their enemy. The Portuguese planted an accused. Professor Gustav, um, I think two issues, um, interesting issues that were mentioned. One is on the anthropology of the community, the needs of the community right now. Although I do not uh, in depth in, in that um, community itself, but I think yes, it is an issue that should be addressed. But I'm also happy to note that people like Michael Banerjee has already addressed the issues. Uh, there are more things that can be developed. There is no animosity between other Eurasian groups with the Portuguese Eurasian groups. <laughs> Um, although I do have some questions actually personally with Michael on doubt of the numbers that we have spoken just now. Um, but um, that is, a, is, is one thing. The other thing mentioned by uh, you was the generalization of Dutch and Portuguese. I totally agree. Um, of course, Portuguese were not only made up of Portuguese people who came from Portugal. And again, we look at genealogical points, names, Actually, when you trace back the names, you can find names that goes back to Spain, for instance. I, have an, I had an uncle whose name was Robles, and he knew that his ancestors actually came from Spain, not Portugal. 
right? And of course, the Dutch also, when you generalize them, they were not all Dutch. Looking at the names themselves, you could tell that some of them were Scandinavians, Germans, they were even British, right? And by the way, in the Portuguese, they were also Dutch people who worked with the Portuguese at that time. We know that. Okay? And as for the second question, um, we're talking about cohabitation at that time. Huh? So yeah, I think it was a um, culture that, could, uh, that, was, that, that could, people could accept things at that time. It was normal to have one wife, two wives, and then you also have your concubines at the same time. It was a common culture in Asia. So when Europeans came here, they saw, wow, it's a good idea, right? Eh? <laughs> Let's adopt this. <laughs> but as a matter of fact, um, if you look at CR boxes book, uh, you will also find that it speaks about the policies introduced by the government, not only by the Dutch, of course, by the Portuguese. In fact, our booker himself, when he was in Asia, he found that mixed people Eurasians at that time, mixed between Eurasians, uh, sorry, Europeans and Asians, were actually stronger in Asia. They could adapt easily. Um, somehow or another, it worked for them. So it was a policy that was implemented as far back as our previous times. And of course, the Dutch also had the same idea, based on the same principle, on the same policies as well. So there was a sort of encouragement to the people for them to marry, uh, intermarry. On the religious point of view, from the Dutch Reformed Church, there was also the need to uh, legalize things. That means we don't want good Christian people, or they didn't want good Christian people cohabiting with others. I mean, you can't live in the same house and as if you're married people, you know, but then you're doing other things like that. So it wasn't the Christian thing to do. So they actually encouraged these people to marry those local people. And many of them actually were also slaves. So the Dutch, not sure about the Portuguese, right? But for the Dutch, they did marry their slaves. But the condition to do so was for the slaves to be emancipated and for them to become Christians. So many of their slaves were actually emancipated, were free. They became Christians, they married their masters, they had children, and they became, their children became Eurasians. Thank you.